Growing the Future, the first of a series of webinars brought to you by the Anthropocene Transition Network on regenerative agriculture and local food systems. Today's guests, Morag Gamble from the Permaculture Education Institute, Anne Gibson from the Maloon Institute, and Robert Pekin from Food Connect Foundation. I'm your host, Ken McLeod, coming to you from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who for countless generations cared for the country on which the city of Sydney now stands. This occasional series will focus on regenerative agriculture and food systems. But what exactly do we mean by regenerative agriculture? One of the best definitions I've come across reads, Regenerative agriculture is a system of farming principles and practices that increases biodiversity, enriches soils, improves watersheds, and enhances ecosystem services. Regenerative agriculture aims to capture carbon in the soil and above ground biomass, reversing current global trends of atmospheric ac accumulation. At the same time, it offers increased yields resilience to climate instability, higher health and vitality for both the farming communities and for those that depend on their produce. What's not to like about that? In today's session, we will range over three topic areas, how permaculture principles can inform regenerative agriculture practice and bioregionalism, how landscapes in a dry continent like Australia can be rehydrated, and what experience has taught us about building collaborative food networks between producers and consumers. But before I introduce our panellists, I'd like to invite you to pause for a minute, particularly those of us here in Australia, and reflect on what it means to share this continent with the oldest surviving culture on the planet. For 60,000 years, Indigenous Australians have managed themselves on this continent pretty well in harmony with the cycles and seasons of the land. I'd like to acknowledge their success in living sustainably, in adapting to the huge transitions between geological epochs, and in developing cultural traditions and land management practices finely, finely attuned to the custodianship of the land. I would like, I hope on behalf of us all, to honour their elders, past, present and to come. Sadly, I have to begin today's program with an apology. Charles Marshall was to be our first panellist today, but unfortunately Charles has been called away by her work to meetings that she can't avoid this morning, which clash with our session. So um, I, uh, I'm very sorry that we will miss out on uh, Chell's immense experience as a, uh, um, an Indigenous ecologist, a marine biologist, and as a, a steward of um, protected lands. Our other three panellists who are with us, uh, Morag Gamble. Morag is a global leader of the permaculture ch movement for change, her work exemplifying the shift beyond sustainability to regeneration. A community urban agriculture pioneer and award-winning edible landscape designer for 25 years, Morag has enabled urban communities around the world to create beautiful shared edible landscapes using a process she calls citizen's design. Morag has led programs in 22 countries and has taught in communities and universities around the globe, most recently at Schumacher College in the United Kingdom and a food politics course at Griffith University in Brisbane. She has seen the direct social and ecological impact of industrial farming 
on marginalised farming communities around the world, in Indonesia, in India and more recently in East Africa, and works with urban farmers, school farmers, community gardeners and educators designing and developing local food systems. Our second panellist is Anne Gibson and is a senior landscape rehydration design consultant with Maloon Consulting, Contracting and Certifying. She brings a unique mix of skills and experience which enable her to provide advice and prepare landscape rehyd rehydration plans for MCCC clients across the Australian farm sector. Anne has specialist knowledge and experience in geology, hydrogeology and water planning and also has a, uh, extensive experience in developing policies and legislation for the environment. Maloon Consulting, Contracting and Certifying is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Maloon Institute, which was founded by the late Tony Coote. The Institute is a research, education and advocacy organisation that actively regenerates landscapes uh, and both demonstrates and shares rege regenerative methods of land management. Their approach aims to re-establish the natural function, fertility and resilience of agricultural landscapes. Our third uh, panellist is Robert Pekin. Like tens of thousands of small and medium scale dairy farmers, Robert was a casualty, a casualty of the deregulation of the Australian dairy industry that took place during the 1990s. In what was a deeply traumatic period for himself and his family, Robert, like so many other dairy farmers, lost the farm that had been in his family for generations. Robert's path to redemption and healing led him to the discovery and practice of Community Supported Agriculture, or CSA. First practiced in Japan, Germany and the United Kingdom in the 1960s and then blossoming in the USA and beyond in the 1990s, CSA is a model of direct food-based exchange between farmers and members of a nearby town or city who become stakeholders in the farm enterprise, sharing its risks and its bounty. Food Connect Brisbane was established by Robert in 2005 as a multi-farmer CSA and this vision and its principles were firmly at its core. It is recognised internationally for having broken new ground in food distribution systems and innovative social enterprise and has served as a model and a source of inspiration for many like-minded enterprises emerging over the past few years in many towns and cities in Australia. Where I'm seated is uh, actually a place called Crystal Waters. It's an eco-village in the Sunshine Coast hinterland and I was just um, thinking the other day, I've been here for 20 years now and um, I remember saying I'd, I've, I've been here at this eco village for three months and all of a sudden snap it's 20 years so I don't know where that time's gone but so I'm I'm um, I'm really excited to be part of uh, today's discussion because how you've gathered this group um, you know we're missing chels um, uh, you know wonderful indigenous perspective on regenerative farming that grounds everything that we're going to be talking about so I'm hoping somehow we can uh, we can involve her energy in, in this conversation, even though she couldn't be with us today. Um, and, and having the broad scale agriculture thinking, landscape thinking, um, Rob's uh, with Anne, the uh, Rob's um, way of thinking about how to bring farmers and urban communities together. So I thought what I might focus on then would be looking at you know, the small, the small farm, the tiny farm, the community farm, the, uh, the urban farm, because, you know, we, as you know, more than half of the global population lives in, in the city. And, and actually, with 75% of the world's land in um, farmland being in less than two hectares, and that's a huge amount of food production that happens in very small spaces. Now, that's also taking, not taking into account that anything smaller than two hectares is not considered as a farm and not counted in that way of thinking. So actually, we, I think it's a time to maybe rethink, particularly given 
the situation we've just come through with, well, and still going through with COVID about thinking about food resilience and where our food comes from and the challenges with um, food coming from around the world and being um, transported from long distances. You know, it's not that cities are, are going to be able to feed themselves entirely, but what can cities feed themselves and what, in which way can we start to think as, of cities as farms? And there's so much potential that, you know, when we start to look at all the spaces in between the city structure, we can start to see the possibilities. You know, often when I come back from different parts of the world where there's food everywhere, food is growing, you know, in little vacant lots down the streets, you know, up walls, on roofs, and you come back to an Australian context and it sometimes feels, well, often feels a bit like a food desert. So I, you know, when I'm teaching permaculture courses, uh, particularly in urban environments or with community farms, I ask people to sort of walk around with um, food lenses, uh, like garden lenses, where, where are the possibilities, where are the edges? And this is part of the, you know, the principle of, of permaculture um, thinking. Well, the behind permaculture thinking is diversifying, using the edges and the margins, and also thinking about scale. What's a human scale food system? And bringing as much food production as we can as close to home as possible. Um, and then, you know, enlivening the soils, collecting the water from, from our homes and our schools and wherever, sinking that into the landscape, enriching the soil and growing as much as we can right there, right around us. So there's so much of the salads and the greens and all those sorts of simple things that could be uh, mostly grown in and around in and around our homes. Now, it's interesting, um, a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment is with, with perma youth, um, youth that have been activated through all the things that have been going on in the world right now and who are really concerned about the state of the world and starting to come together talking about permaculture and home gardening as, as a way of being practical activists and making a really positive difference in the world. And somehow that's rippled out to actually reach a number of different refugee camps. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because through this connection between the youth in refugee camps in, in East Africa and the, and the youth in this global perma youth movement, they've been having conversations and they're learning about how food, uh, food um, distribution has just um, been very difficult in these last time. And half of their rations uh, is what they're getting now. Malnutrition and hunger is going through the roof. Some of the World Food Programme has said that it's like 265 million people who will be on the brink of starvation by the end of this year. And this is not kind of news that we're hearing about. And the, what, what we're learning is that what's going to make the, what's going to make the difference and, and build resilience within these communities is a renaissance or a, a revolution of home kitchen gardens, bringing the food right back, right local, right back into their homes and communities. So there's these kitchen gardens that are popping up all around little huts in, um, in the refugee camps right now. And the, and the young people are starting to really drive this. Now, um, the other thing that I think that we need to think about as well as the emergency food and building food resilience in, in crisis time is thinking about how we can be more future thinking and look at our cities and rethink our cities and go, okay, so in 50 years time, where is most of our food gonna be coming from? And what sort of planning do we need to put in place to actually think about how that might happen? There's a number of really fascinating examples of urban and suburban development. They've been around for decades and they're starting to be looked at now in a little bit more way. And what, there's one of the examples I'd like to share with you is um, it's a farm, a suburb in, um, in Denmark, in a nearest city of Aarhus, just on the outskirts. So it's a standard type suburban development. But the first thing they did was identify where the best agricultural land on that site was and they made that the farm so the center of the suburb is their farm and all of the waste water all of the waste nutrients flow from the houses around down into the farm and they employ a farmer and a farm team to manage that land regeneratively to produce as much food as possible to go directly back into that local community that lives there as well as having the farm they also have allotments because people also want to have connection 
with the land and grow food. And it's a really important thing to think about. My experience with community gardens and city farms is that not necessarily people are going to be growing much of their own food necessarily, but they connect with the food system. And that connection is really important. And that the understanding of, of the challenges and of the seasons and, the, and it revalues food and farming and farmers uh, in a way that if you are just a consumer, you don't get. And so you start to understand why there needs to be a certain price or why certain relationships or connections or why it's important to value regenerative farming practices because you, you're in it. You're in the complexity of a farming and food system. When you're, when you're just looking from the outside, it's, it's an intellectual exercise. It's not an embodied one. So community gardens and city farms, I think, are, have a really important part to play with that to help value you know, the, the bigger farms and the community farms that help to feed the bulk of the food that we have in our, in our communities and, and neighbourhoods. So that scale, again, is important. Another thing that's really interesting about this um, community in Denmark was that they also have shared animal systems. So this suburb has a shared dairy. They have shared beehives. They have shared chickens. And so, you know, they would have clusters of these. So maybe once a fortnight, it's your turn to look after the chickens and you get all the, all the eggs you need for the fortnight, and then the next day it's someone else's. And so within these urban environments where people say, oh, I don't have time to do this, or I don't have the space, you're actually creating a collective space and a shared amount of time. It means you're not stuck to do that every day and you get that um, opportunity to be engaged in, in the food system. We have a similar little thing going on here at the eco village where I live. Uh, we have a shared dairy, and there's about 10 families who look after these cows. They're the most loved cows. Just, we have three or four of them. And that's enough uh, milk from those cows for us to be able to feed our families and our neighbours with milk and cheese and yoghurt. Um, and and every, every week or every fortnight, actually, now, um, I go down and I milk the cows. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to connect maybe less rural communities with their food system again. And so these collective and collaborative approaches uh, that we can engage in, I think, are, are really important. Um, so in my garden too, just, just to kind of finish off, I, I have a small garden, really. I, I live in an eco-village and an important part of this eco-village is that actually 80% of the land is common land. And I think part of what we need to be rethinking in our urban environments, um, as well as making spaces for farms and rethinking about the flow of nutrients and, and the metabolism of our food system. Uh, what's the name of the town in Denmark? Horshoi, H-J-O-R-T-S-H-O-J. I'll type it later. When I'm, um, so um, part of this idea of creating commons, you know, in, in urban parts, say Brisbane, we have a really great uh, system where the local government actually buys up land for, for nature. I think what we need to be doing is actually creating land in and around our urban environments that's farmland, protecting the farmland in and around the edges of our cities so that in 50 years' time, as I was mentioning before, we still have space in and around our cities because, as you know, most of... Most cities are, are built in and around places that have good agricultural land, rich soils. And so we need to protect those soils. We need to re-enliven those soils. We need to start thinking about how we can create regenerative food systems right in and around our cities. And that's about creating a sense of commons. So that could be commons for community farms, commons for city farms and community gardens. And then also thinking about how in our small spaces in and around our homes, we can grow as much as as possible and I was just saying in my little garden here I I have I built a house and and designed it in a way so that the water flows into the garden and I've terraced the site so that I collect all the water and it sinks into the ground and the nutrients the plants the diversity of the plants creates a living system it's a perennial food system the roots are deeper the plants are in community meaning that they have much deeper connection in the in the soil with all mycelium network I basically do a small amount of gardening for an amazing amount of food, which is um, fruits and herbs and vegetables and medicines, perennial foods, um, uh, food for the chickens, and then the chickens. So with the eggs and with the greens and the fruits, that's a bulk with almost no work. It's a bulk of 
um, my food that I need um, on a daily basis and a way to feed my family. So by just rethinking and redesigning our spaces in and around our homes, in and around our communities, and collectively working with others and working in a sense of being part of a bioregional food shed, we can start to shift how we think about and how we relate to our food system. And, and I'd also like to encourage people too that um, in a day we begin um, Plastic Free July. And I always, always, there's so many other issues apart from plastic I know in the world, but it's a big one. And why I talk about it is because it actually makes people rethink their food system. If you try and attempt to go plastic free in your food for the next month or even for a day, how does that then shift the way you relate to what it is, what kind of foods? And typically it's going to be encouraging you to get more localised food from a, from a community food source or from your own garden or foraging down the street, down a local park. I mean, I grew up in a suburb in Melbourne and my first memory of food um, harvesting was actually going to the local parks and, and traditional farms that were now sort of community parklands and harvesting the apples and the and the um, and the wild foods that were in and around the landscape. There is so much food that's around us. I think often we just walk past it and we waste a lot of food too. We waste a lot of foods in our backyard gardens. Um, my, my example that I always use is the pumpkin, for example. You know, when you grow a pumpkin and when a pumpkin grows itself often out of a compost or out of a rotted pumpkin that was in the far corner of your garden, that whole pumpkin vine is edible. The shoots, the leaves, the tendrils, the skin, the seeds, everything. We often look at the food that's wasted in the food chain or at the shops or when it comes into your fridge. Oh, sorry, that's my time of saying we stop, sorry. Um, but so the, actually, when we're looking at the pumpkin vine itself, we waste most of the food that's growing. We waste most of the leaves, all the extra bits of the... And, you know, I think probably... You know, often we say we've wasted 50% of the food that gets grown in a farming system. I would hazard to say that it's way more than that because we never recognise actually all of the food that's there. So we need to shift what we see as food. We need to shift what we think um, we can eat and what is, what is edible for us and, and think more creatively about how we can um, be part of a regenerative food system at all levels, from urban to rural, to the wild foods, to, the, to all parts. Uh, so um, I think my timer tells me that it's time for me to, to wrap up and hand over to Anne, who's going to be talking from a completely different scale of, um, of, uh, of food and farming. So thanks, Anne. Thanks, Morag. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the, people, of the land that I'm sitting on um, here in Ngunnawal land. Um, and, you know, for us at Maloon, that's a really important connection. And, and as Morag alluded to, I'm going to take you on, a, I guess, a journey at a different scale. So, um, Morag, um, what a wonderful introduction to urban, and, um, uh, urban farming and, and what we can produce in, in food systems that are, are close, I guess, um, by to where people live. At Maloon, we, um, you know, I guess we look at landscapes at a broader scale and we look at landscapes across Australia. And I guess in our mind's eye, one of the things, uh, certainly for me, thinking about what does rural Australia look like? And immediately we think of droughts, we think of floods, we think of hard times, we think of climate extremes, we think of erosion, we think of paddocks that are bare. And yes, we've got good times in amongst all of those, but we've also got some really hard times and some really, um, some landscapes that have been really, um, you know, uh, degraded. And they've been degraded right from the very beginning since, since European, <coughs> pardon me, since Europeans came to Australia. And there are records from only 20 years after some of these areas in Australia were populated by Europeans where pastures had declined, where erosion had really started to take off, where soils had started to degrade. And here we are over 200 years later and we've got not only the same problems but on a larger scale and, it, you know, 
more acute. So, so we want to look back and see how did our landscapes function before Europeans came to this country? How were landscapes managed? And what, what are the key processes that are involved in that? And so it's not only just looking at what happens above the ground, what can we see, what are the changes in vegetation, what are the changes, you know, the erosion that we can see, the changes to our streams, but what are the processes that underpin that and really start to understand how our landscapes function and then develop some innovative approaches to put some mechanisms in place. And they don't have to be complex and they don't have to be large, but to put them in place to start to return some of those processes and landscape functions to improve the health of our land, our water, our vegetation and you know, all the, the birds and the animals and the fish and, and, and the invertebrates that, that depend on that land. And then coupled with that is the benefits in agricultural productivity. And so really starting to look at what can we do on farms to manage our animals and our plants and importantly our soil, including our fertility, our water infiltration, um, our water holding capacity, soil carbon, what can we do to improve all of that that then has that positive feedback effect on productivity but also then on our environment. And so at Maloon, we believe that you can have a productive farm that's more productive um, than perhaps your traditional land, you know, traditional um, way of managing farms, but also improve environmental outcomes. And so I guess that's where um, the story of Maloon Creek and Maloon Farm um, becomes really important. So the Maloon Institute was founded specifically to demonstrate and share regenerative land management practices. And so it was founded in 2011 but the work that the Institute is doing actually started long before that. Um, and Ken um, mentioned Tony Coote and he, he was the founder of the Institute and he, he had a real passion for, 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 for questioning and for pushing the boundaries and for looking at better ways of doing things. And so he had many, many people involved in in looking at ways that he could improve the health of his farm. And that went to both the environment and the productivity. And so in 2006, our pilot project was formed where three kilometres of Maloon Creek was transformed. And that was basically done through a series of leaky weirs. And I wish I could show you the the, the before and after photos where Maloon Creek was this highly eroded, degraded system, and it literally looked like a desert. It was just awful. And I, I'm sure you can picture what that looks like because so many of our landscapes in Australia look like that today. And so we put in this series of leaky weirs on the farm in the creek. And when I say leaky weirs, they're designed to be leaky. So, yes, they're designed to hold back some water, but they're also designed to let water through the system. And by doing that, we start to build sed sediment up behind those leaky weirs, and that then starts to grade the system back up so that they're not so channelised. And we start to re-establish some of those processes that are so important to the health of our streams. And so we start to spill water back out onto the floodplain and start to reinvigorate some of those, you know, some of those um, features on floodplains that just don't see water anymore. We start to rehydrate and recharge the aquifers that sit next to the streams. And so you basically re-instating um, a your, your sponge, if you like, in your floodplain that holds water. And then in dry times, that water then flows back into the creek and provides that really essential base flow. And on in this latest drought at Maloon Farm, we still had water coming out the bottom of the system after you know months and months and months of no rain. 
And that's just incredible. And the quality of the water as well, um, you know, is really high. And it's just so important for everybody and everything that depends on that system. The downstream farmers can see the benefit. The critters that live in that stream and in the riparian area around the stream see that benefit. And then, of course, for an agricultural enterprise, having that water stored in the system for pastures to be able to, to access during those drier times is also incredibly important. And so fast forward from 2006, Maloon Creek has been absolutely transformed across that three kilometre reach. But Tony's vision wasn't just about transforming his, his little part of the catchment. He wanted to see that expanded. And what the Maloon Institute has managed to do, and I, I guess, you know, this is where where Morag was talking about communities in, and the importance of bringing people together. And the Maloon Institute and the work that we do in Maloon Creek, it's as much about the people and the social and building community as it is about the landscape and the environment and the product productivity outcomes. And so we've brought together 20 landholders across the catchment and um, together they hold about 23,000 hectares of land. So it's absolutely no mean feat and it's been, you know, it's, it's been a journey, but um, having the farm that Tony set up as a demonstration of just how a few simple interventions can make such a big difference um, is a fantastic way of, of bringing people on board. And so <clears throat> we've now installed 32 structures across seven and a half kilometre reach of the stream and seen amazing benefits again across that larger reach. And every time we expand what we do, we see those benefits almost exponentially expand as well. And so excitingly, we're just about to um, break ground on another 68 structures over 42 and a half kilometres of creek. Um, it's been, yeah, it's been a lot of work, um, but the outcomes that we look to achieve through that and and then demonstrate to the rest of Australia about what is possible are amazing. And so not only have we got, we've got funding from a variety of sources, including the Commonwealth um, and state governments, but that funding's not only just for putting structures in the creek, but it's around monitoring. And that's really, really important. And that's a key part of the work of the Institute is to monitor and have that scientific basis to demonstrate and prove and understand what it is that underpins the outcomes that we're seeing so that we can replicate that in other areas across Australia. Um, and the Institute is working in many areas, including um, in North Queensland. We've done a lot of work with communities up there and, and that's particularly important in terms of erosion and sedimentation of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and we've got lots of other um, collaborations across Australia, um, Western Australia, um, um, other parts of New South Wales where we're looking to expand these approaches and, and start to regenerate and rehydrate other landscapes as well as Maloon Creek. <coughs> Pardon me. And so the other part of the Maloon Rehydration Initiative that's so important for us is around education. And so we hold lots of field days and workshops and other um, training opportunities at the farm um, so that we can engage the broader community and bring them along on the journey and demonstrate what can be done and how it can be done and how those measures might be replicated, um, you know, on your farm or in your catchment. And so that, that's a key part and that was a key part of Tony's vision was to share, um, share that knowledge and that understanding. 
And so one of the things that, um, of course, is critically important is, is that Maloon and, and the farm that Tony left is an operating farm. And so we have a beef cattle operation and we also have an egg production operation. And so not only is it really important um, in terms of furthering the work in the creek and looking to rehydrate the landscape, but how we actually manage the landscape as a whole from an agricultural productivity perspective. And so there are, there are lots of approaches that we're trialling and running on the farms that are focused on soil health particularly um, and using your plants and your animals on the farm to drive, you know, that feedback loop between photosynthesis and nutrition and soil health, soil carbon, um, and to get that positive feedback loop happening so that our so that our um, microorganisms in the soil and our fungal networks in the soil are, are growing, um, which then has a positive influence on the plants and then a positive influence on the animals that are grazing on those, on those plants. And so, and, and then of course, water is the key input into all of that. So if you have a dry landscape, nothing nothing's going to grow, nothing's going to live, not, the, not all of the organisms within the soil that drive those processes. It really depends on hydration. And so, but then that also has a positive feedback loop as well. And so, so looking at questioning how we actually manage our, our plants and animals in our agricultural landscapes is really, really key um, to achieving those outcomes because rehydrating the creek and the floodplain are fantastic outcomes and they have amazing outcomes for, for biodiversity and habitat and, and the health of those riparian areas. But, but of course, we all know that, um, you know, our landscapes are, are made up of more than just our creeks. Um, and so there, are, so there are many, many techniques that we are trialling and that we employ across the broader landscape um, um, to, to get those, those systems humming as well. So I think, you know, in summary, um, there, is, there are so many amazing um, uh, approaches that can be employed and I'm really excited that there is such a groundswell at the moment of looking and questioning at questioning the way that we're managing our landscapes and there's such opportunity across Australia and across the world indeed to to start um, you know putting in place some practices that that bring about positive change and they don't have to be big they don't have to be um, you know they don't have to be expensive um, just even subtle changes can make a big difference. So I think I'll, on that note, pass over to Robert. Well, thanks so much, Anne. That was wonderful and really good to hear um, the Maloon story. I was there many years ago with Tony and just um, very inspired by particularly the um, getting all those landholders together along one creek line. It's, it's, a, it's an inspirational story. And as you said earlier, you know, um, uh, uh, mentioning in the, um, you know, the sophisticated intelligence and knowledge the First Nations people of this land have. And uh, they were the impetus, uh, you know, in giving Tony that sort of a bit of a, hey, mate, you know, uh, you can do this part of the creek, you know, some really good, you know, some do some really good things along this part of the creek line, but what about the rest? You know, it's almost like, um, it, you know, it, it, it really is, um, and, and what I'm going to present is, is the same sort of thing that, um, Basically, you know, there's a lot of heavy lifting being done around in individual pockets, you know, with more ag and urban farms, um, just so many great things that are happening. Um, but what the First Nations people of this land really demonstrate is that it's of no use unless we can do it all together and we operate as a collective. And uh, what Tony and um, Uncle Max and, uh, and the, you know, the, the team at Maloon Creek have demonstrated is, you know, uh, Westerners can probably, you know, get along. 
and do stuff together, despite the sort of um, you know the uh, you know the the issues around um, what are the root causes of of um, the capitalist society we live in the, at the present is this concept of land ownership, whereas they have a concept of custodianship. You know, the land owns us, we don't own it, and uh, and so that's a really tough barrier for us to get through if we're really going to um, operate um, ecologically and economically. Um, to bring about systems change. Um, so as Ken um, introduced, you know, the producer uh, consumer networks, um, I really see that it's sort of like a critical piece. And as an ex dairy farmer, as Ken mentioned, losing the farm, the piece that was really, um, you know, that really disappointed not just me as a farmer and, 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 you know, we all know the story of many farmers committing suicide as a result of the pressure that's put upon them um, because of the market forces. So, the um, you know so the the principal um, way I wanted to operate when I you know licked my wounds and got over myself and you know had a bit of a cry was that we need if we were going to have change we needed to have a distribu a distributor in the middle who could treat farmers and consumers with fairness and ethics and 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 respect uh, that was being very done and unfortunately the big retailers and and the system at the moment uh, don't do anything um, near what they possibly could do to respect the heavy lifting done by, you know, the particularly the regenerative farmers who are going against all odds and then eventually get squeezed because of a commodity price or a market failure or whatever else it is. So that's, that, that's the power. And when I sort of looked at the system, being a farmer, and I thought, my God, I don't know anything about the person who drinks my milk. And, and that's my mm. loss. And it's also the customer's loss. So it's uh, building those um, uh, building those relationships and giving people an opportunity to be able to to value what farmers do on the land um, and giving those farmers then once they're acknowledged for that then those farmers um, and principally you know a lot of a lot of female farmers I don't know if you're aware of the invisible farmer project here in here in Australia but it's really demonstrating that the women on the land are really connecting. <clears throat> with the indigenous people and connecting with the landscape themselves they have a much more they're much more attuned to uh, nurture and caring for land um, and so uh, um, in in the work that we do um, um, guided by the principles of csa and i won't go into all i mean I, there's a couple of there's about there's seven principles of csa you know the solidarity economy um, uh, knowing the farmer um, uh, uh, what I call the uh, the mother principle of you, you get what you get and you don't get upset. Um, so accepting the produce from the region and from the seasons and what the farmers can grow for you and then entering into a relationship with those farmers to maybe push the boundaries of what they don't know they could possibly grow in those regions. You only have to go back to, you know, in my case, my uncles, you know, they were growing all sorts of produce on the farm that when I eventually took over was just milking cows. Um, so when I went to growing herbs and uh, medicinal herbs and a whole bunch of other things, you really do, um, it stimulates, uh, it, it makes farming exciting again because monoculture farming is just not exciting, um, which is why a lot of our farmers today love sitting in tractors with the radio on or a, you know, a great music track and air conditioning because that's where they get their stimulation from. They're not getting their stimulation from, you know, the, 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 the tremendous intellect that's needed to understand all the functions, um, you know, the ecological functions um, that we have to work with in a, in a natural farming system. And um, once you have that acknowledgement between a consumer and a producer, there, there's this, there's this um, wonderful responsibility and accountability um, harnessed in a tension way, and we need to have tension. And as I said before, you know, the mother principle of you get what you get and you don't get upset is that's a tension that, that we all need in our lives. You know, a good boot up the ass never hurt anyone in terms of waking up to yourselves. And our mothers did that. You know, they said, you know, you get what you get and you don't get upset. You know, I'm not going to feed your bloody crap or drop in at every shop and buy a bag of chips or a tub of ice cream. Because I want, I, I want you to grow up healthy and strong and, and you know, with all your faculties. And, and that's what the CSA principles are all about. And what I've sort of tended to do um, 
when I started Food Connect in 2004 was I really wanted to test um, because as a farmer, I didn't have much, oh, what's the word? I, I, I didn't have a lot of respect for city people, you know, to be frank. I really sort of thought that they were just lazy sods who worked five days a week and, and didn't do much more. And so I wanted to really put a bit of a rectum rocket up city folk and see if they were up for a different game, if they wanted to have a relationship with farmers. And it turns out it was a whole bunch of Brisbane mums who were clued on enough to go, I think this bloke might be up to something rather. And through that process, I got over my, you know, issues and, and, um, and uh, failings around what I perceived as city folk were, you know. Um, and that's the other um, aspect of, of a CSA is these people who all have professional skills in the city, whether they be accountants or marketing people or storytellers or logistics experts, they're all needed in a short chain for food system. You know, they're great chefs. All of those skills that leaves the farmer to get on and grow great food and, and build the landscape function to where it should be. So, um, uh, you know, that's, I suppose, a way of, a, of, a, of, a, of an introduction. Um, the key things that I followed um, throughout my time at Food Connect and, in, in, and, you know, later on when we established the shed was that we're around system disruption. We're not about market disruption. Um, that whole journey, you know, you look at Uber and you look at all these great tech companies, that actually, if they've probably done anything, they've given capitalism an even worse name because they've taken the concept of the sharing economy and basically just used that to, to, um, to exploit. Um, and, and that's the sort of system that agriculture has been on, an extractive, exploitive system. Farmers have been exploited to give cheaper prices and, you know, I remember, um, Morag, you might remember, there was an amazing article by um, the Schumacher Society, maybe 2009, that was titled, um, Cheap Food, Cheap Food, Cheap Food Makes People Hungry. I don't know if you remember that. It was a great provocative title um, because there's enough food grown on the planet at the moment to feed 11 billion people. And there's only 7 billion of us. So as Morag was saying before, she's right. There is more than 50% food wasted. You know, when I look at, um, uh, particularly um, broccoli stems. Succulent broccoli stems were used to be known as poor man's asparagus. Um, we sold so many broccoli stems to chefs because for them it was so different, it was so unique. And the farmers loved the fact that they were harvesting not just the broccoli, but the broccoli stem. And then what happened, you had all these little broccoli shoots, you know, 10 or so to each plant, and they'd go through and do a second harvest and you had all these, like a cross between a broccolini and a broccoli, that then the chefs could use, because they love that smaller stuff that they can, you know, put beside a, um, you know, a scrambled egg um, on, on the breakfast plate. It's a really unique way of demonstrating using, using the whole crop. And that's where a CSA really is, is um, you know, it, it's all about how do we buy the whole crop off the farmer and utilise that whole crop in so many different ways. Um, and with the shed, we've got 12, tenants who use the three shared kitchens downstairs, they operate in a way where they're sharing those waste streams. And, and we're, you know, I mean, they're autonomous businesses, you know, enterprises, social enterprises that are dealing with food. But we put a bit of a, you know, we stimulate them to think more about the waste side of things. What else can they use? And we've got some, um, some great examples downstairs that I haven't got time to talk to you about. You'll have to come for a tour. Um, but really inspiring examples of, people who never thought of, well, hadn't been thinking about how can I reduce the waste in my manufacturing process and turn it into a product. And then when they turn it into a product, it's got more value and then you can pass that value back to the farmer. So um, another key aspect of, of um, I call them the three, the three sort of holy grails of humanity that we've got left is to divorce ourselves from market forces, decouple ourselves from fossil fuels, and collaborate, what I call the holy, the final frontier for humanity is to get along. And CSAs do this wonderfully. You know, we, we, we have to get along to make a success of it because we're up against a system that economically, um, you know, has the card stacked in its favour whilst they're externalising the costs of fossil fuels and they're externalising the costs of the healthcare system and they're externalising all of these things. Until those costs are internalised, we've got a battle ahead of us and we have to, that's, you know, I suppose one of the great strengths of CSA or what we're doing is we have to do it in a very lean way 
and leaning on all of those skills that surround us to say, how can we do this affordably? Because at the end of the day, it's the people who are missing out on this good food, the ones who have got malnutrition, who need those, um, those food literacy skills, those cooking skills, they're the ones that are missing out as we go towards this really expensive organic wrapped in plastic, transported around the world, you know, um, um, industry, you know, the organic industry rather than a movement, which what it originally was um, around a movement. Regional food for regional people, value added in the region, and the surplus goes to the next region, not back in, not into the cities and then back out into the region. So this is the, the critical role that, that food sheds or food hubs play is we're here to um, uh, give farmers the opportunity to grow more produce for their region. And then in the food hubs, we have the people who are value adding and utilizing as much as that crop as possible and then selling that regionally. And then you have the economic multipliers. You know, Michael Schumann says it's, it's probably between a three times or a four times factor, increasing the economic multiplier in those regions when you do that. So it's, um, it plays an enormous economic stimulus um, for the town. And as I say, you know, Food and agriculture system change changes everything because everything is interlinked with food. Uh, one of my other favourite sayings, um, while I'm on the saying side of things, is is um, uh, the missing word that's not used um, as in the in the industrial food system is they're always saying um, uh, agri food, agri business, agri finance, agri tech, um, agri this, agri hyphen, agri hyphen. The word culture isn't there. And that's the main problem is that we're not valuing the culture part of the word agriculture and it's a foundation of civilization. And, and as you know, going back to the, um, the original sort of uh, um, acknowledgement of First Nations people, you know, they were the most amazing farmers we'll, we'll probably ever see. We will never emulate their method of farming. Um, and they farmed, you know, if, if probably all of you have read Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu. Um, you know, the, the, the words are there in plain sight from white explorers where they were harvesting grains, you know, stacking grains, uh, making bread, making flowers, and they've been making bread for 40,000 years from what we understand at the moment. They had just the most amazing way of using a mostly perennial system, um, whereas in Western agriculture, we're using a, a mostly annual system. We're always disturbing the earth to get the next crop. So um, we've got a long way to go um, to, to, um, to having that form of regenerative agriculture. But the critical missing piece is the retailer, the wholesaler, the distributor, the logistics in the middle. If that doesn't value what those farmers are doing, it's pretty much all for naught. We're not going to go anywhere. We've only got about 10 years to do this. If you look at the IPCC um, and what a lot of other people are saying around the looming impacts that are coming around the road, or coming down the road. And if we don't do something about it now, it's gonna be forced upon us by the next crisis, or the next crisis, or the next crisis. And we've just seen through the pandemic, people are now, um, are now much more acutely aware of the fragility of the food system as it presently stands. You know, the geopolitical instability has really shown up um, some of the limitations, uh, particularly around the logistics of the current um, um, industrial food system. So yeah, some of the things, the key components, I'm just going to run through these. Um, community ownership is critical. Um, we need, you need to have, economically, people need to have a, a part in, in um, whatever it is you create, whether it's a small farm um, or a food hub like us. You know, 50% of our community um, own, you know, we've got 513 people who, who participated in purchasing, raising $2 million to own the shed. Half of them are just regular mums and dads who live in the neighbouring suburbs. The other half are seven impact investors. Um, and as I say, we, we will never change the food system until we change, unless we bring the financial system along with us. It has to be economically feasible. It has to stack up. It can't survive on charity. It has to be something that farmers um, and other business people look at Evaluate in terms of an extractive mind, not looking at it in an extractive way and saying, oh, yes, um, we need to internalise some of those costs. But we're hard-nosed we're hard business people around how do we make this economically viable 
So the financial system comes along for the ride and the more of them come along for the ride, we see more of them waking up to the fact that yes, that other system is not serving as well. Fostering leadership is really important. This has been the, probably the biggest and the, and the most difficult thing for us to do from external consultants' eyes. We always get told, you know, you've shared your model. Pretty much we cannibalise our business all the time. We're always showing other people, um, City Cousins in particular, here, here's all our tools, here's our system, um, go and set up your own box system and we'll give you all our customers with it. Um, now that's been, that, that fostering leadership and giving people the autonomy and the courage to start up their own business and create the food system around their, you know, um, their genius is probably the most powerful thing we can do. Yet the Western world in business, we don't often do that enough. We don't open our books and say, you know, here's all the good bits and here's all the bad bits as well. So then they can go and iterate and cherry pick the best bits. And, and as we've seen in a lot of cases, a lot of our farmers and a lot of our, you know, have created CSAs um, um, modelled on us, have gone out there and done it better than us. So then we've learnt off them. So it's this mutual sort of, ah, yes, we didn't think of that before. But because they're a bit younger and a bit smarter and they've sort of looked at, you know, uh, um, in a detached way, they can look at our business and go, ah, Roberts hasn't thought about this, we'll go out there and beat him to it, you know, and, and think about it in a different way. And that creates um, a collaboration. You have to have collaborations of business networks that allows us, like with COVID-19, um, the networks just responded so amazingly. You know, so many of our restaurants went and started up box systems because a few of them already did it and we just sent all our information out, here's, here's how to do it. We lent our packing room out. A lot of the kitchen uh, tenants down here in that two weeks of chaos of going, holy shit, you know, what's just happened to the world? Um, I've just lost my complete market. In that two weeks, we just employed them over at Food Connect because we quadrupled in sales. So there was always all sorts of ways that we all worked together. Um, some of our farmers who were supplying farmers markets said, we're out of the farmers market scene, too dangerous, and they set up box systems. And then three weeks later said, I hate these box systems. Here, have all your customers back. I'll supply you and you do the boxes. So it was just, just an amazing thing to, to witness the networks acting as a collaboration, responding together to do all sorts of amazing things and keep food flowing. But it was critical in, in our case, because our farmers are all regionally based, we had supply, you know, we rang our farmers and said, we're looking at sales doubling or, or, or more, will you be able to supply? And they said, absolutely no worries at all. We've got, we've got plenty of food here. Yet the supermarkets were running out of food. And they had to shut down a whole bunch of things. Um, I think I've mentioned most things there. Uh, the, the sense of autonomy. I can't, I can't stress enough that um, when you go into something or other that is owned by the community, there needs to be a sense of we've got to give that entrepreneur or that business leader autonomy to unfold their highest and best use. It's very different to operating in a cooperative model. Um, I love cooperatives, but I don't think they really release the higher potential within each human to do the unique work that every one of us is able to do. And, and I think that's what, um, that's one of the things, one of the keys to our success is always saying, you know, I can see it in their eyes. When a farmer comes and says to me, I want to supply you guys, but also I want to get, you know, in touch with a couple of restaurants. Um, I say, listen, you're just going to go through, you're, just, you're going to pass through us. For the next six months, we're just going to build your confidence around how do you talk to a chef and how do you work with a chef? And then basically they become on their own. Um, the final thing I wanted to, to, to sort of stress in this producer consumer networks, enabled by online technology and the amazing sort of ability that online technology has to give us the power to, work, to give all farmers this opportunity, is in the 16 years I've been running Food Connect, the original organic Farmers who are really clued onto this, they're all good now. They're fine. You know, they've got their own CSAs. They're all running with this. The farmers are within one hour radius of Brisbane and Melbourne and Sydney. They've got this, they've got this stitched up. Our big responsibility now is to, to those farmers who are, who, who are really being um, pressured by the, um, by the commodity markets. It's our, this is the next phase for us, is how do we... Um, how do we work with them to supply hospitals, universities, prisons, all of those larger anchor institutions in a way where they 
where they feel empowered and where they can um, get the confidence to go down a regenerative pathway. Because at the moment they're feeling stuck, they're feeling alone, um, they haven't got the, 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 they haven't, you know, there's, not only is there not the capital for them to do that, because as Anne or any, any regenerative farmer will say, it's, it's a massive learning exercise and also an exercise where you do have to drop in production for a little bit of time while you figure this whole, while you restore those ecological functions back in your landscape. So that's the next, next phase for us all, is how do we work with those, those broadacre family farms that are being, that are being you know, exploited um, by, by the industrial food system at the moment. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Robert and Anne and Morag. What an amazing series of visionary uh, presentations we've just heard. Um, there's a few questions here and I'm sure there'll be a few others coming. And I notice that Morag, for example, has been busily writing things down. So you might have some questions you want to bowl back to other people on the panel, Morag. But um, well, there's one question here from Mark who asks about Maloon Creek uh, and the experimental, experimental approach there. Uh, is that um, being emulated in other places outside of Australia? What sort of uh, international um, ripples are you creating? Yeah, look, um, the Maloon project has been recognised by the UN um, as, um, I'll just have a look here, but um, uh, so yeah, it's been recognised by the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network as one of only five model case study projects globally. Um, and that's the aim of that is to help develop guidelines for sustainable, profitable and productive farming. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and look, there are many projects across the globe that are, are looking to do the same thing, to restore and rehydrate landscapes. I guess Australia has a very um, unique landscape um, and, you know, the approaches that we take here are, are transferable, but, um, but I, I guess, um, you know, yeah, every... Every landscape has its own challenges. And so, so across the globe, there's so much opportunity, um, but there's, as I, as I alluded to earlier, or so much energy and excitement in this space as well. Thanks, uh, Anne. Morag, did you have some questions? Or was I just imagining that? You're, you're muted. Uh, You're, you're still muted, Morag. Ah, there you okay. are. All right. No, I didn't want to cooperate. Okay. Uh, it wasn't so much uh, questions. It was more picking up on some of the key threads. Uh, and there were so many. Of, like my page is full of this mind map of, of thoughts. And it's wonderful always to be in conversation with people who are really passionate about this and are, like I said, fully, fully engaged in it, um, you know, in the complexity of this. Um, you know, there's just something that... Um, that Robert brought up just before about the, the need for rethinking our, our farming, food and farming systems in a more perennial way, like uh, a way of how, how do we start to think more about what does our food system look like if we're focusing on perennial food systems um, and also um, through diversification as well. So having many more um, crops on each of the farms and many more different um, in um, interconnected species that that you know I'm thinking particularly in in the scale that I work with that that the places which we that we're, we're creating healthy human habitats in a way that we're diminishing our footprint on the planet we're diminishing the human footprint both in terms of farming and of development of any kind into a smallest footprint possible to enable as much of nature to be rewilded, to restore the ecological systems that are that need regenerating, to bring the planetary systems back into balance. So this is a systemic change that we need to be taking place in, in the food and farming system and in, in our way of thinking about how we connect farming, nature 
and um, and people together rather than separating them out into separate blocks and not seeing these links. But bringing that back down to where I was thinking about this perennializing, you know, even if it's not necessarily using um, perennial foods to start with, the transitionary approach is, I think, is exactly what Robert was talking about, this idea of you look at a broccoli and, you know, normally when you say broccoli, what pops into your mind? You think of the little, it's like the immature flower of that plant, which is the bit that, that you eat, right? But no, you know, we heard from Robert about the stems. It's like poor man's asparagus. But, you know, I think we need to toss out the, the poor man's bit and just go, it's broccoli stalks. It's edible, you know. Stop trying to make it something that seems it's like it's less than uh, beautiful food. Um, and and so uh, with that too, so you've got the stems, you've got the, the flower, but then you also have the second wave. So what's happened there is instead of pulling the plant, and its roots and, and re-disturbing the soil, it's actually allowing the plant to stay longer and to be used as a, as, a, as a crop for much longer. So the longer that we can keep the plants in the ground and keep taking parts of it. And so it's thinking about not just crop in terms of um, space, it's thinking about crop over time. You know, one of the things that I think about in my garden particularly uh, is say mustard. So mustard spinach is this enormously abundant thing. So as soon as it's sprouted, tiny little sprouts, you can start to be eating the leaves. Then it gets into massive great leaves. That's the next wave. Then it go, throws up this, the, the um, shoot for the, for the seed, going to seed. And that, while it's still flexible, is a beautiful spicy asparagus. And, and then it, it goes into flour and you can be harvesting the flour. That's another type of food. And then it goes to seed. The young seed pods are like little spicy peas. And then when the seeds go hard and brown, you've got mustard seed. So if you think about each plant in terms of its entire life cycle. So in my garden, for example, in smaller scale permaculture systems or farms, you'd be thinking of also harvesting broccoli leaves as a cabbage alternative. And so we can start to perennialize and use a lot more of our food systems and add a lot more diversity in and think about that time. And also uh, like uh, Rob was talking about that value adding of, of relocalizing. I mean, one of the problems in our food systems is that we've, we've lost all the manufacturing and the productions, you know, it's, it's just, you know, a lot of the value adding has to happen somewhere else. And so it adds so much into uh, the impact of our food system and the, the lack of freshness. Everything has to be so much more processed because of that. Now, um, some of it can happen in places like the food shed, which is brilliant. And I'm, I'm really proud to be one of the care holders there at the food shed as well. Uh, going back to the Horseshoe example, they also designing within those settlements, as well as the farm, they have community centres which have fully equipped kitchens which enable people locally to, to value add the food and so that means that they could then uh, participate in the local farmers markets or in the local uh, food network somehow because they have the health department approved kitchens and so we can we can scale this up and down in so many different ways um, and uh, just you know as as uh, Anne was talking uh, I was thinking about the landscape here within the crystal waters one of the key things that's transformed this landscape from being uh, basically an eroded paddock 30 years ago is through the rehydration of the landscape. So there's well over 17 what we call lakes here now and all of the, all of the gullies have been um, revegetated in a way that it slows down the water. You know, there's like trees falling over all the way up and down it. And, you know, I often go for walks through there and they're amazing how much nature is coming back into the place, but also the different microclimate that's happened here. And we've just had a recent study showing that there's um, 170 species of birds that have been documented here within 650 acre property. So this is becoming a wildlife habitat and, and reserve, as well as it being uh, a food producing place, as well as it being a people place. And uh, it's, a, it's it, you know, all of these things together, uh, uh, is where you know it's not just one as as Rob was saying you know it's not just one element it's we need to be thinking about all of it and we all need to be connecting with with broad scale with the distribution networks with and thinking about it not just as a hobby or something you know permaculture is not just something to do on the weekends or you know in your spare time it, you know it's also about creating 
um, real livelihoods about transforming our landscapes and restoring planetary systems and creating collaborations. You know, it's that merging of the circles of influence in, in all different parts of our regenerative economy and regenerative practitioners um, globally. Thanks, Morag. There's a few questions here, and we're going to have to move through them fairly quickly to try and get them in. Uh, there's a question for Robert from Jess, who says, what might a metropolitan food uh, resilience strategy look like, especially in New, for New South Wales? Um, and she elaborates a little bit further. Robert can read that himself. But uh, she, she's basically saying she's finding as a city person, it's very difficult to get traction yeah. in Sydney. Yeah, I can answer both of those questions. Um, hi, Jess. Yeah, it's, um, and I'll sort of, um, it's a bit of an invisible and no one's really talking about it too much, is uh, Australia has uh, really, is really going to struggle in the next little while with the resilient food system. Um, we're, we're, we've been told a little bit of a furphy that we grow enough food to feed 75 million people. Well, that's only when you include the amount of sugar we grow and the amount of meat we grow. If you take away those two um, commodities, we're only growing enough food for around 40 million. And then when you take away a couple of the other things, we're actually net, um, we, we don't grow enough fruit and vegetables for ourselves, um, and particularly seafood. Like we're, we only got about 10% um, domestically we feed ourselves in seafoods. And you can go through the list. CSIR have got a pretty strong list that they've been doing since 2012 and 2015. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty sad style. So, um, uh, building resilience in our food system um, was something that we looked at when we celebrated 10 year, uh, 10 year anniversary and we sort of thought, well, you know, um, we've got 10 years, what do we need to do for the next 10 years? And we thought of creating what we call the Brisbane Food Plan. So basically we said in the next 10 years, where would we like Brisbane or where should Brisbane get its food from? Um, that through a social justice lens, an ecological lens, an economic lens and a human health lens. And we engaged with Griffith University and UQ and, and basically posed this sort of question. Um, uh, and then that has filled, that's our strategy. That's Food Connect strategy over the next 10 years. Um, and we come up with five sort of key, key actions um, uh, that we needed to follow. And I'm happy to share that with you. And I'm not going to tell you what our five were because Sydney's five might be completely different. And it'd be really good for you guys to actually go through a process where you sort of go, well, through these four lenses, dividing all of the food groups. So we come up with 13 different food categories um, and four, across four lenses and, and just, just critique them all and then said, and then do the zoning, the permaculture zoning exercise. So where should, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, take Sydney, for example, where should, what food should come from the Sydney Emberance and then what should, food should come from an hour out of that. And then, you know, three hours out of that. Um, and we had six zones, the sixth zone being the whole world, you know, so we, we did that sort of approach. And it was really a great exercise for a lot of people to go through working with the researchers, looking through those four lenses. Um, and, and through that participation, you actually get a lot of people going, oh my God, I, you know, um, yeah, why am I growing? Why am I buying herbs or open hearted lettuces um, through a shop, you know, it should be grown on my balcony or in my backyard. So we actually told all of our lettuce farmers who grow open hearted lettuces and herb farmers, in 10 years time, we're not going to be buying that off you. You need to think about growing something else for your region. And so it has this ripple effect that our farmers in Bundaberg or, or Gympie have had to, we forced them to think about, you need to grow for your town and your region, not for Brisbane. Um, and so that's, that's the approach we took. And then the second part of your question, Jess, was empowering people who really need this food the most, you know, from a malnutrition point of view, is buyers clubs. Um, and I, I, if you've read the book, The Stop, um, um, about um, the organisation in Canada by Catherine, or, or Catherine Scharf. Catherine Scharf came over to Australia about four or five years ago. And it's a really inspiring story of community food enterprises um, uh, how they set up buyers clubs, so they buy in bulk. So we have a lot of buyers clubs here in Brisbane who buy in bulk to keep the prices really low for really good produce. But then we bring them in through the kitchen to give them skills on how to, how to actually cook with this stuff. And it's not cooking with individual things. It's actually just learning um, the process, learning a system, you know, don't overheat, use this oil, 
it's just basic sort of stuff to empower them to go and start cooking by themselves. And particularly um, in Brisbane, we're neighbouring to a, um, a, a suburb called Maruka where there's a lot of African um, uh, refugees who live there. They've got so many amazing skills around cooking and bringing them into the kitchen and empowering them and people learning off them. And, and then we, you know, uh, through that process, you also, um, uh, you, you, you discover the wonder and the amazing cultures that are out there that we as Westerners sometimes didn't have that perception of. But through food and cooking, you change your opinion and you, and you, and you sort of, um, you, you get along as the, you know, the holy grail of humanity is to get along and accept each other. And food is a great way of, 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 um, of um, uh, uh, food is a great way of people um, because it's using your sense of smell. Um, it's using, it, you don't have to be a brilliant mathematician. Um, you don't have to be, you know, you know, excellent at grammar and all those other things that Western cultures have taught you about, you know, you get higher pay if you do, if you're good at maths and English and all of those other things. This is around, you know, basically, you know, using your hands, using your sense of smell um, to cook something that, that, that is, um, that's inspiring and empowering and, uh, and nourishes people and the land. Um, yeah, so that, I think that's, has that answered that for you, Jess? Um, yeah, this is right. I mean, we need to move away from the charity model. I mean, philanthropy, philanthropy philanthropic money is a, is, is a great tool for catalyzing change, but we shouldn't be dependent on it. It's a great way of initiating something or other to, to, to give it a bump start because we're competing against those businesses that externalize all those, all those, um, uh, all those uh, costs that we all bear either through our health system or through our tax. So, um, so we use philanthropy in a really strategic way to start something up and then over the long term, you, you put some financial feasibility and you turn it into a business. Okay, thank you, Robert. Um, there's a question for Anne, and it's about uh, whether um, is it, well, the start of the question is, is it possible to visit Maloon Farm? But then it goes on to ask from Renna, uh, how is uh, Maloon Creek set up as an educational centre? Yeah, sure. So the answer is absolutely. Um, we, with the COVID period um, in exception, we, um, <clears throat> pardon me, we hold field days. <coughs> uh, we hold field days at the, at the farm where, where you can come and visit and um, we hold guided tours across that day and, and often we'll have a focus um, and, and this year a, a focus topic. And so this year, November 7, um, we're hoping that we'll be able to hold a field day. And if you pop onto our website or onto our Facebook page, we've actually got that date up there and you can you can register your interest for that day. Um, and our focus for the day is going to be on soils, but of course you'll be on farm and um, and be able to hear from from our wonderful people about the, the project out there. Um, and look, as I, as I mentioned um, in my in my talk, a key focus of the institute is education and training, and um, you know bringing communities together. And so we not only hold field days on the farm, but we do have um, focused workshops and training opportunities as well. Of course, a lot of, of which recently have been um, had the kibosh put on them. But um, look, that that is an absolute focus of ours, and we do. Um, also work very closely with land care groups and other community groups across Australia to, to bring, um, you know, I guess to bring the message and to, to help to raise awareness about the type of things that Maloon's doing and, and what might be possible across different landscapes and in different communities across Australia. So if you're interested at all, yeah, as I said, please get in touch, hop on the website or the Facebook page um, and, um, and yeah, come and come and have a look and see what we've been able to achieve and how that might transfer into your neck of the woods. Thank you, Anne. Um, can I just um, uh, add there that uh, on on the the day I visited uh, Maloon Creek, the farm, um, I 
there was a, a, a group that had been organized from Canberra of permaculture people, that a permaculture group in Canberra had organized to come and visit. If there were people who wanted to, say in Sydney, who wanted to organize a group to come and spend some time there and, and learn something, is that, is that possible? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, well, there's a um, challenge for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, please do get in touch with us, um, either me directly or, or through the website or the Facebook page. And um, we, we do often have groups come um, to have, you know, I guess a more tailored tour of the farm and a more tailored discussion. Okay. And could you put your... Uh, your website yes. address in the chat, please. Absolutely, can and, do. And we'll save the chat and make sure that everyone gets to get it if they want. Um, there's finally, there's a question from Mark um, who uh, asks, and I suppose this anyone could answer this, uh, to what extent has the, uh, co the COVID-19 uh, challenge or threat uh, increased possibilities for co collaboration in relation to food. Um, and do you want to pick up on that or um, Morag? I know Robert is bursting to have a go at that. <laughs> I'm sure you've got thoughts, Morag. Um, you go first, Robert, then I'll jump in next. I was just typing, <laughs> I got distracted, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've only got a couple of minutes left. You're on mute, Robert. Thanks, Ken. Sorry, everyone. Um, yeah, really, a truck was going past, and I thought I'd better block that out. Um, yeah, the uh, the collab it certainly has uh, made people collaborate a lot more. Particularly, oh, well, I, you know, I'm only aware of the Brisbane um, scene to a certain extent. I don't know really uh, mm -hmm. in other capital cities because we've been just flat out dealing with with what's been happening up here. Um, but I'll tell an interesting story of um, one of our one of our um, tenants um, tenants in common because they're also careholders as well. They they supply both big entertainment centres and big venues as well as IGAs, and um, they uh, a lot and they do gluten free um, products, um, a lot of blended powdered products ready for pre baking and things like that a lot of the stabilizers and the agents. So they send the raw lupins over to China, they get blended over there and then all these stabilizers, their whole supply chain just stopped. And so they had to find a, um, Australian blenders um, to basically for those byproducts. And in some cases they had to not use those byproducts at all because they were some of the, you know, as you know, with the, the food industry, particularly the, um, that side of things there's a lot of you know clever things that go into our products to stabilize bread or to prolong shelf life and all those sort of things so it not only made them collaborate who's who's in brisbane that they could work with in terms of um, keeping the produce their product but also um, who could they find from the packaging point of view even the stickers even the ink was coming from somewhere else in the world so they had to find closer collaborations within you know, um, Australia for a start and then within Queensland or Northern Rivers. And that was a really great, um, uh, I, I really, I didn't know that all these things come from around the world until COVID happened. And it basically forced people to rethink um, every single expense line. Um, where is that coming from? Well, like, where's my toilet paper coming from? You know? <laughs> um, uh, and, and that forced a lot of people to, have a relationship with someone they didn't have a relationship with before um, in Australia or, or closer to town. And uh, uh, I think that's just a, a, a marvellous outcome of COVID, you know, not, not obviously um, downplaying the tragic results it's had on people who have, um, who have passed or, or been, you know, sick by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And just, just quickly to add to that, I mean, at, from a community perspective as well, there's been massive collaboration that's been happening, um, you know, particularly in terms of creating far more mutual aid systems. And, and that links, I guess, into, you know, what uh, Rob has been talking about with, with food box systems, um, doing um, community bulk buying, creating um, new community garden systems and, and new community farms, even 
getting together and, and doing uh, more farming and gardening locally and a lot more exchange is happening over the fences and using front yards and backyards and rooftops and, and exchanging things. There's been a massive um, shift in people actually putting little um, food box stores out the front of their place, even in suburban areas. It was something of, you know, like the rural roads before, but all throughout um, cities we've seen that people are talking about you know oh I just popped down the road someone's got the surplus of this or apps as well shares um, you know spare harvest kind of things or um, exchanging that, those so massive um, shift in thinking uh, yeah maybe what you're talking about with line items uh, I mean it's simply about feeling a deeper sense of security you know I think we've rethought what 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 does it mean to be secure and what does it mean to be food secure? And uh, thinking about what that means, um, particularly here in, in Australia, has completely shifted. And it is really about, about that knowing where the food's coming from, about having, having a seed bank, for example. You know, one of the things that, that really hit people was when, they, when, when it hit, the, all the seed stores ran out of, uh, of seeds and seedlings. And only those communities that had their community seed exchange were still flying, you know, seeds were going all over the place with this. And so those things build in that resilience and sense of um, not just personal security, but community security and, and community resilience. And I think it's been a real wake up call for a lot of people and, and for all of us um, to be to be thinking differently and to be interacting differently within our food system. Okay, yeah, thank absolutely. you. Well, we're going... oh, sorry, sorry. do we have time that I can just add a little bit to the end? Very quickly. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is not Maloon related, but in my personal life, I do a lot of work in the local community um, around um, sharing. And so during COVID, there was this wonderful upswell of people in the local community who, um, it, you know, they saw issues with our food supply, but also saw people who weren't able to go to the shops because they were immune compromised or, or, or you know, had someone in their household who was immune com compromised. And um, so I've seen this absolute groundswell of people in my local community who were baking bread for our, for our neighbours and delivering it <clears throat> to them once a week. Um, you know, fresh, beautiful home-baked sourdough um, who are <laughs> sharing produce from their gardens and from their fruit trees and there really has been uh, I've seen this upkick of, of a real sense of coming together and a real sense of sharing and it's not just around food um, but but specifically in this context, it's just been wonderful to see um, how people have had that time to reflect and to think about how they interact with the people that live around them. And it's, yeah, it's really heartening to see. And I hope that that continues, um, you know, as life so slowly returns to normal. Yes, well, I guess the lesson is look around us, look around our communities, look around our region, our bioregion and see what's happening there and how we can utilize it and connect with it and support it. It reminds me of some years ago when I was living on the North Coast, uh, a group of very enthusiastic people were organizing a screening of the film, which I think is called something like The Story of Farmer John or something like that, about a, 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 a CSA project in the United States. And they were saying, oh, this is fantastic. It's all about how to set up a CSA. And I said, do you know about Food Connect in Brisbane? And they looked at me and said, no, what's Food Connect in Brisbane? And I thought, just down the road, we, we need to know what's going on and connect with it and support it and collaborate. So on that note, can I thank uh, Robert, who's already disappeared because he had the architect arrive, uh, Morag, and Anne. It's been a fabulous discussion and I really thank you on behalf of everyone for your, not just for your contribution to this uh, discussion today, but for the magnificent work that you're doing in the world. So thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Ken.